Uh, welcome everybody and welcome to today's masterclass, Info Masterclass. Uh, I have the pleasure to welcome Katarina Wimmer from um, um, the University of, of um, uh, yes. sorry, uh, yes. for Innsbruck in Austria, uh, who is a molecular geneticist and specializes in the diagnostics of hereditary tumor syndromes, amongst which NF1, of course. And who is going to give us today a very interesting lecture, uh, lecture on, on the difference between NF1 and constitutional mismatch repair deficiency syndrome. So um, before we actually start the lecture, I just need to give you just a couple of instructions regarding the questions. You will not be able to interact directly with uh, Katarina, uh, but uh, you can put all your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box, and I will be moderating the Q&A right after the lecture. Uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, the floor is yours, Katarina. So, um, thank you, Marco, for this kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen with you. And this, I hope you can see it now. Yes, we can. Thank you, Katarina. And I'm going to put it as a slideshow. So, um, yes, as you said, I'm very honored that I may give an infer masterclass on constitutional mismatch repair deficiency syndrome and its connection with NF1. And it, um, I will show um, that it can be sometimes a differential diagnosis to NF1 or Legion syndrome. So just to give you a short overview on my presentation, I will first um, give you an introduction of what is mismatch repair, what function it has. Then I will um, introduce the constitutional mismatch repair deficiency syndrome, short CMMRD, the genetics and the clinical phenotype and then the overlap of CMMRD and NF1 phenotype. And um, we will then discuss um, when um, CMMRD should be considered a differential diagnosis to NF1 or as a possible differential diagnosis to NF1 in a cancer patient and in a suspected sporadic NF1 or leeches syndrome child in which we cannot confirm this diagnosis genetically. So um, what is the mismatch repair um, mechanism? So it's one of two mechanisms that um, safeguard that our DNA during cell revision is faithfully replicated. So many of you may know that during cell division, the DNA needs to be duplicated, and that is replication, and that is performed by um, the enzymes polymerases. And these polymerases um, make mistakes um, during replication, but they have a intrinsic proofreading activity, which is executed by the exonuclease activity of these polymerases, and they can correct the errors that they make, but still some errors escape this proofreading, and then we need a backup system, and this is the mismatch repair system. So uh, the mismatch repair system um, recognizes the errors and corrects them then. I will not go into the detail how this is done. This is very technical. Um, I just want to mention here that we have four important proteins um, in this mismatch repair um, system, which is MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2. And these proteins are um, encoded by the uh, genes which have the same names. So um, these um, mismatch repair genes together with the proofreading of the polymerases together make sure that um, the um, after replication, the new DNA strand is nearly error-free. So 
So less than um, six arrows per, per diploid um, genome during a cell division. So the mismatch repair genes, the four mismatch repair genes, they um, work as, for instance, the NF1 or the spread one gene as tumor suppressor gene. And individuals who have in, an inherited um, heterozygous loss of function germline mutation or pathogenic variants in one of these genes have a cancer predisposition syndrome, which is called Lynch syndrome. So um, if you have a mutation, most of the patients with Lynch syndrome have a heterozygous mutation in the more penetrant MNH1 or MSH2 gene. Um, less Lynch syndrome patients have MSH6 and PMS2 genes, but this is due to ascertainment bias because these genes are more penetrant. So they confer a higher risk to tumors. And the tumor spectrum of Lynch syndrome include, includes mainly colorectal and endometrium cancer, but also a number of other cancers. Um, the lifetime risk I'm giving here, don't nail me down, depends much on which of the genes is affected by a heterozygous mutation and whether it's a, a, a man or a woman and um, which um, mutation is present. So this is um, just a rough estimation. So um, the tumors um, in arising in patients with um, Lynch syndrome um, they have, they arise because one cell um, gets a second hit in the wild type allele, just as in the NF1 gene. And from this, a neoplastic cell arises, um, which is mismatch repair efficient. And um, if this system doesn't work, um, of course, um, um, mutations can accumulate of the replication. So the characteristics of um, mismatch repair deficient cells or tumors is in most of the cases that the proteins are no longer expressed and that can be detected by immunohistochemistry and that um, these cells accumulate a lot of mutation that may be single nucleotide exchanges, um, mainly C2T, but also other single nucleotide exchanges, and also small insertions or deletions. And these um, type of mutations occur very frequently at so-called microsatellites. So these microsatellites are sequences of um, short sequences who contain repetitive elements. Um, I show that in the next slide. So these repetitive elements can be a single nucleotide as shown here. So a strand of say um, 25 Ts for instance, but it can be also denucleotides so like GT, 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 or three or penta or up to 10 nucleotide um, repeat units. So um, during replication, what often happens at such um, repetitive elements is that um, um, there is replication slippage and some of um, the um, repeated elements loop out. And um, then if um, the polymerases replicates the daughter strand, um, these two nucleotides are not um, replicated, uh, and the daughter strand contains only 23 Ts. Normally, this is then detected by the mismatch repair system and correct. But if the mismatch repair system does not work any longer, and um, this daughter cell clonally expands, all the daughter cells will have only 23 Ts at this locus. And we can detect this by um, PCR amplifying this locus. 
and then doing fragment analysis to see um, how large the PCR fragment is. And then we do that not only for one microsatellite marker, but for a number of microsatellite markers and compare normal tissue and tumor tissue of the individual. And if um, compared to the normal tissue, many of these markers show a shorter sequence. So a shift to the left here um, of these um, signals, then um, we know um, there is some microsatellite instability, so shortened um, repeat elements. And um, the rule is that um, we call a tumor microsatellite instable if 40% of the uh, microsatellites analyzed are instable, have show a shift, and stable if none of the microsatellites analyzed are shifted. So this um, microsatellite instability testing is a molecular test that indirectly tells us a tumor is mismatch repair deficient. So that's as much for the introduction of um, um, mismatch repair system. Um, and I come now to the actual topic of this lecture, um, constitutional mismatch repair deficiency. And I show this slide because um, this slide shows the first um, publications which were published in 1999 of um, in two back-to-back -back, um, papers in cancer research. Um, and um, these papers described um, um, the phenotype of CMMRD for the first time. Um, these both papers described um, the phenotype of children which were born to consanguineous so or related parents who were coming from Lynch syndrome um, families. So um, both of the parents were Lynch syndrome patients, had a heterozygous mutation in the MLH1 gene, and the child inherited from both parents the um, mutated allele. So um, um, both alleles were inactivated. So um, any cell of this child had a mismatch repair deficiency. And the phenotype of these children was that they very early in life developed um, malignancies, mainly lymphoma and leukemia. Um, in this family, there was also a child with a megaloblastoma, a brain tumor, and a rhabdomyosarcoma. And interestingly, all the children who had this um, condition also showed um, signs reminiscent of NF1, particularly cafeole spots, but some of them also other um, signs like freckling and um, Cutaneous neurofibromas. So today we are 25 years later and we know much more about this condition, which is now officially called constitutional mismatch repair deficiency, has an OMIM number. And we know um, from about 200 cases that have been published um, that. Most of the patients, and that is in contrast to Lynch syndrome, have mutations in PMS2 and MSH6, so up more than 50% in PMS2 and about 20% in um, MSH6, and um, only a few in MNH1 and MSH2. And the reason is um, PMS2 and MSH6 are more prevalent in the, um, in the normal population population heterozygous mutations. So that reflects more um, the frequency of mutations in these four mismatch repair genes in the general population. We know now that the clinical phenotype of CMMRD is characterized by a broad tumor spectrum. Um, the main tumors we see is hematological brain and intestinal tract tumors. I will come to this in a minute, but
But in essence, any tumor in a child could be um, potentially a CMMRD associated tumor. And nearly all patients have pigmentary alterations, and most frequently, these are papillae spots, often reminiscent of um, NF1. So um, you see here, for instance, a child with CMMRD who has a segmental distribution of typical NF1 um, capriole spots and also freckling, but other patients um, and ha may have also other hyperpigmented features or skin patches or skin alterations. And um, some children have uh, also hypopigmented um, spots. Um, these bluish um, spots are very rare in CMMRD. It has been reported in many patient papers that usually um, the hyperpigmented spots are different than um, those seen in um, children with NF1 or Leach syndrome. And but I think um, this may be recognizable in some patients by some experts, but um, often this is not, it is not distinguishable if, if, if a child has CMMRD or NF1 um, or DG syndrome from um, the skin pigmentations I show you here um, um, on the right and on the Left side, um, patients um, with typical cafe au lait spots in children with NF1 um, and CMMRD. And you may um, guess by yourself which um, of these cafe au lait spots come from children with, um, with um, NF1 or CMMRD, and also here some phases. Um, I have no voting, unfortunately, but here is the um, answer. So these are all um, images taken from children with NF1, and these are all images taken from children with CNM. So how frequent are these NF1 features in children with CMMRD? So um, multiple cafe au lait spots, two or more, and other hyperpigmentations um, of the skin are very, very frequent, present in nearly all um, children with CMMRD. Um, six or more typical NF1 um, cafe au lait spots are seen uh, most likely in approximately half of the patients. And um, some patients really fulfill tri clinical criteria for NF1. So they may have six cafe au lait spots and fracking or other signs such as dish nodules, which we have been seen in CMMRD patients, cutaneous neurofibromas, plexiform neurofibromas, and there are also um, each one child with a tibia pseudoarthrosis and a sphenoid ring dysplasia and optic pathway glioma, to my knowledge, has been found in more than one child. Already. So um, these children may have really a, a phenotype, a skin or other phenotype reminiscent of NF1, and that explains why in the past many of these children were misdiagnosed as NF1 children. So why do these children have um, these features that are reminiscent of NF1? I told you before, if you have a mismatch repair defect um, and these children have in any cell of the body a defect in the mismatch repair gene, that leads to accumulation of um, all kinds of um, point mutations. And the NF1 gene is already in a normal cell, a highly mutable gene. Um, and that explains why we have so many um, sporadic NF1 patients. Half of the patients with NF1 have, have um, no family history of NF1. So it's a highly mutable gene. And it has, there is also some indirect evidence coming from cell lines 
that are mismatch repair deficient and from tumors that um, we see in these cell lines of NF1 um, mutations. And we have um, um, one patient reported um, that was from the original families um, in whom um, retrospectively in NF1 um, mosaic mutation was found. Um, so this mutation was not present in in the in in all cells, but only in a proportion of of the cells. So it happened after um, uh, postzygotically and um, probably due to the mismatch repair defect. So very recently, um, another paper was published of a patient who with CMMRD, who had also clearly NF1 features, um, threatening here, cafeole spots, and the plexiform neurofibroma. And also in this patient, a um, mosaic NF1 mutation was found. Interestingly, it was a duplication of a C in this stretch of seven Cs, um, which is sort of a mi uh, microsatellite element in the NF1, in the coding region of NF1. This group, um, this French group, analyzed then another 23, 22 patients and found in another two patients mosaic NF1 mutations. So at least about 10 to 15 percent of the patients may have re indeed mosaic NF1 as a result from the constitutional mismatch repair deficiency, but others may have only localized in the cafeole spots NF1 mutation, possibly also spread one mutation, but possibly also other mutations that cause hyperpigmentation. CMMRD patients also have other non-malignant features um, that are not typically associated with NF1. The most prevalent are multiple developmental vascular abnormalities. You see that in brain MRIs, and it is reported that very many of these patients have that up to 100%. Um, Less frequent are other brain malformations such as a genesis of hypophysalosis or non-therapy um, induced um, cavanomas. What I think is probably underdiagnosed are pinomatricomas. These are um, benign tumors um, um, in the skin, uh, which results from beta-catenine gene mutations, and it has been shown um, by the group of Eric Legius that um, really um, um, children um, with multiple um, pinomatric comas have also probably also secondary to the mismatch repair defect mutations in this um, gene in the pinomatric coma. Um, pediatric lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus is um, rare. Um, and, and it's a little bit more frequent in CMMRD patients. And um, a number of CMMRD patients also have um, defects um, in immune globulin um, production, but usually this does not come to clinical attention. These are just laboratory findings. So I come now to the... Um, spectrum of malignancies that is associated um, with CMMRD. As I told you before, there are four main groups, mainly hematological malignancies. Amongst these, T-cell lymphoblastic uh, lymphoma are the most prevalent, and they have a mean age of onset that is quite young, so six years around. And a little bit later in life, CMMRD patients often develop brain tumors. Amongst these, high-grade gliomas are the most prevalent, but there are also others, such as medulloblastoma, um, seen in CMMRD patients. And patients who reach um, um, teenage age or adult 
early adulthood will more or less inevitably um, develop um, colorectal polyps and colon cancers and also later than also other Lynch syndrome associated tumors. And then there is a fourth group which lumps together all the other um, malignancies that we see in CMMRD patients, more frequent are sarcomas and embryonal tumors, but as I said, in essence, any malignancy may be a CMMRD associated one. So with the next slide, I would like to compare the, um, the, the or show the overlap of the um, malignancy seen in NF1 and CMMRD. So optic pathway gliomas are typical NF1 um, um, tumors, um, which are rare in CMMRD. And so far, we have never seen a juvenile mon myelomonocytic leukemia in a CMMRD patient, but it is also rare in NF1 patients. We also have not seen MPNSTs, so malignant peripheral nerve disease tumors in um, a CMMRD patients. So these um, are typical tumors for NF1 and really rare in CMMRD. However, rhabdomyosarcoma can be seen um, or can be associated with NF1, but can also be associated with CMMRD. We see it in both. And there has been reports of an association of NF1 with pediatric high-grade gliomas and also with secondary MDS and AML. Um, but these are older papers, and at that time, CMMRD was not that well known. And these were all in patients who were not genetically confirmed to have NF1. So our current knowledge that these tumor types are more frequent in CMMRD really challenges the diagnosis of uh, NF1 in these reported patients. So with this, I would like to come to my first take home message. So we should um, be aware of CMMRD as a differential diagnosis in any child um, that has that is suspected to have NF1 or Leach's syndrome and has a malignancy that is not typically associated with NF1, such as an MPNSC or JNML. Um, so, and that should be suspected even if the patient has mosaic NF1, because we have recently learned that mosaic NF1 may not be so rare in CMMRD patients. Um, in cases where we have um, NF1 signs in the child that has a rhabdomyosarcoma, we need to do differential diagnosis and find out whether the child has NF1 or CMMRD, because um, that is important for, um, for future um, treatment and um, surveillance. Um, and um, our um, um, previous knowledge on the association of pediatric high-grade glioma and secondary MDS, AML, possibly also on neuroblastoma and WILS tumor is really challenged by our knowledge of these tumors being um, frequently, more frequently associated with CMMRD than with NF1. So of course, the NF1 features um, were going also in um, diagnostic criteria that um, the care for CMMRD um, consortium, a European consortium has developed um, for um, cancer patients, um, so these criteria should give an, uh, our scoring criteria or our, our scoring system in which each malignancy that could occur in a child is um, scored um, with or is assigned one to three scoring points. Um, and then additional features that point into the direction of CMMRD um, are, are uh, assigned uh, one or two scoring points in any child who any can't, uh, 
pediatric or young adult cancer patient who reaches a minimum of three scoring points should be suspected to have um, CMMRD and should be tested for that. So these are the so-called C4CMMRD um, diagnostic criteria. But um, features of NF1 or Legion syndrome may be present prior to the patient um, developing a malignancy. And then um, um, the patient will um, often be tested for NF1, um, as it was the case in this um, first case who had been described by Manon Swery. Um, in this case, it, um, who had at the age of three years, freckling and typical NF1 associated cafeole spots, um, NF1 testing, um, and that was really comprehensive testing, could not identify an underlying NF1 or spread one mutation. So later on, um, the patient was seen again, and um, due to the consanguinity of the parents who were first cousins, um, it was um, decided that um, CMMRD could be a possible um, diagnosis in this child, and the child was tested, and indeed a homozygous CMS2 mutation was identified. This mutation was already at that time a likely pathogenic mutation, um, classified as likely pathogenic. Uh, pathogenic. Um, so indicating that the child really has CMMRD and it was um, helpful to, to ascertain this um, diagnosis with assays that test for um, mismatch repair deficiency in normal cells. I will come to that, these assays in a second, um, and they could confirm that this child has really CMMRD. It was then put under CMMRD surveillance, as it has been suggested also by the C4CMMRD consortium, but unfortunately between two brain MRIs, as I was told by Manon, and the child developed neoblastin. Um, and I unfortunately from this um, um, So um, often genetic testing for the mismatch repair genes, in particular for PMS2, which is a difficult to analyze gene, may not give a clear result because you might identify a variant of unknown significance or only a heterozygous mutation and then such um, so-called ancillary tests, which have been developed in different laboratories in Europe and also overseas at, um, in Toronto, um, can be very helpful. Um, these assays more or less all test for um, mismatch repair deficiency in non-neoplastic cells, so mainly microsatellite instability in non-neoplastic cells, and the assays developed in Europe have all been evaluated by, uh, in a large number coming of um, patients and controls coming from the CMMRD consortium, but also the logic assay, which is mainly used in, uh, in, in Canada and uh, overseas um, coming from the International Replication Repair Deficiency um, Consortium is um, also very, uh, very much evaluated. So except for the GMSI essay, which is the most simple one, all are very sensitive and very specific and can confirm or refute CMMRD in a patient where genetic testing does not reveal a um, fully conclusive result. I just want to like to mention this essay, which was developed at the Newcastle University in collaboration with our lab um, by Richard Gellin. This is the so-called C constitutional MSI essay, CMSI essay, and it essentially tests also from um, microsatellite instability, but it analyzes um, about 32 mononucleotide repeat 
markers, so 32 um, um, microsatellites, and not with PCR and fragment analysis, but a certain um, method um, that relies on um, next generation sequencing. And the data are then evaluated and result into a score, a so-called CMSI score. And what you can appreciate from this figure is, um, note that this um, uh, y-axis has not a linear scale. It's a nonlinear scale that the CMMRD patients have a much higher score than normal controls for each patient. So this essay, um, we use also a lot in um, collaboration with Richard Gellin at the Newcastle University in patients where genetic testing um, reveals an unconclusive result. And this essay is also very um, cheap and scalable, so we can use it also to screen for CMMRD in research projects. So, um, CMMRD can be a differential diagnosis in a suspected um, sporadic NF1 child, Legion syndrome child, in whom um, genetic testing cannot confirm this diagnosis. But how often is CMMRD a differential diagnosis in such a child? It was as calculated um, theoretically that it is um, very uh, rarely only in 0.4% of cases, uh, differential diagnosis. And we did, in, together with Lupin Messian from UAB and Richard Gelm, a retrospective analysis of a large number of patients, 735, um, and screened them anonymously um, for CMMD and found in this um, large number only three cases with CMMRD. So these empirical data more or less confirm what was estimated with before. So given this very um, rare uh, differential diagnosis of CMMRD to NF1, the question arises, should we test every child who, in whom the diagnosis NF1 or Leach's syndrome cannot be confirmed um, genetically for CMMRD, technically that would be possible, um, but um, we asked this question in the C4CMMRD consortium and thought first we um, think about the potential benefits and harms. So of course a potential benefit would be that you can start surveillance before cancer development. Um, we know now better than when this um, slide was designed that surveillance is helpful and worse and leads to better outcome of for these patients. Um, the parents can be informed about um, their own risk for Lynch syndrome and um, the risk of a second child, which is one to four, uh, and um, make family plans accordingly. Um, but um, I think one of the biggest potential harms is that if this is performed very frequently, that we identify many children in whom we identify a heterozygous mutation or a bus, and that leaves us with uncertainty. Um, and that is awful for all parties involved, for the patients who live with an anxiety, for the doctors who don't know how to uh, manage these patients, and that should be really avoided. So therefore, um, the Care for CMMRD Consortium thought um, of um, developing some recommendations which patients should be um, tested for CMMRD. And they uh, said um, at least three prerequisites should be fulfilled. So first, the child should have at least one diagnostic feature of NF1, and if this is not six or more papillary spots, then at least two um, hyperpigmented skin patches should additionally be present. Of course, the parents should not have signs of 
um, NF1 and um, an NF1 or spread one mutation should be excluded really with comprehensive and sensitive testing. Um, and then the child um, or the family should have one additional feature that points into the direction of CMMRD. So uh, the parents are consanguineous or there is already a di diagnosis of Lynch syndrome or there is a cancer of the Lynch syndrome spectrum in a close relative at an early age. Of, or if there are two siblings who have NF1 features and the parents are not affected and so on. Um, in the patient, for instance, hypopigmented skin patches or atypical um, papillary spots um, or pilomatricomas, multiple pilomatricomas would indicate CMMRD. So at least one of these features should be present and then it can be discussed um, to test this child for CMMRD. And ideally, um, this would be discussed with the um, parents, with a physician who is trained in clinical cancer genetics at the center, which has specific expertise for NF1 and um, related disorder and there is a multidisciplinary team who has agreed to that. Um, the lab who tests then for CMMRD um, should um, have appropriate methods to avoid potential pit pitfalls that mainly result from PMS2 testing. I told you before, I don't need to go into detail, but the PMS2 gene is a tricky gene to analyze and um, you need appropriate methods to um, circumvent um, these pitfalls, either in-house or in collaboration with another lab. And it would be also um, important that ancillary tests that can result ambiguous testing results, genetic testing results are available either in-house or through collaboration. So um, with this, um, I come to my second take home question or my second summary. So CMMRD can be a differential diagnosis in a sporadic, suspected sporadic and one region syndrome child without a malignancy um, in whom we cannot confirm NF1 or region syndrome genetically, but it's a very rare differential diagnosis. So I um, suggest to follow the recommendation of C for CMMID and to test for CMMID only those childs who um, fulfill these criteria that I outlined. Um, and of course, we don't know yet um, whether these are criteria have really a good positive predictive value, a good negative predictive value, how sensitive and specific they are. So we need further studies to evaluate them. And if we um, identify um, children with CMMRD in the course of such um, an analysis, it would be important to follow these um, children very carefully and register them in a database, preferentially in our C4C and database, so that we get more information on the um, the um, the clinical course um, of CMMRD in patients which are diagnosed before um, their first malignancy, which would be a more unbiased um, method. And we will go also be able to evaluate better in these children the surveillance um, protocols that have been developed for these children. And with this, I would like to come to my last two slides. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank all patients and their families who um, really um, um, were willing to collaborate and um, donate also sometimes some material um, for research um, that is very important. Um, I would like to um, thank also um, all physicians um, 
who um, collaborate with us, um, sending patients for the diagnosis and collect data and treat most importantly the patients with um, a lot of dedication. Um, I would like to thank all members of C4C and MRD. So you can see here a picture which was taken when we um, discussed um, the um, guidelines for of swearing, swearing at all. And I would like to thank also the European Reference Network Urgent Tourists, um, with whom we develop now currently new guidelines for CMMRD and my funding organization at WF. So with the last slide, I would like um, to um, um, make some advertisement. Um, so um, we have been working to um, the C4C MMRD consortium together with the European Reference Network and Genturis now for several years, two years, more than two years, uh, on new guidelines for the diagnosis, counseling, surveillance, clinical management, and quality of life. So really comprehensive guidelines that hopefully will come out soon, early next year. Um, and so watch out for it at the Orange and Tourist um, webpage. And there will be also a short version of these guidelines published most likely in European journal. And with this, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very, very much, Katerina, for this very, very thorough um, uh, masterclass. Uh, we don't have many questions as yet coming up from the audience. Uh, I encourage everyone to come up with questions uh, since we have Katerina here live uh, to answer them to answer them for us. Um, there is one question from Annette Backer, which I think needs to be contextualized a little bit. And Annette asks if she expects treatments of C CMMRD to be different from the NF1 treatments. Yes, yes. Uh, um, that's that's in. Um, I I should have said that um, during my lecture. Of course, that's the main reason why we need to distinguish um, um, patients um, with NF1 and CMMRD because patients with um, CMMRD, of course, have, um, uh, first of all, other therapies would work at them. So, for instance, brain tumors um, of CMMRD patients don't profit from the usual therapy of brain tumors, but they um, need immune checkpoint therapy. Um, that works better on them. Um, and they have a a very high risk to develop another tumor later on in life. So they need surveillance and that is also important. And also the recurrence risk is different. Um, so if you have a sporadic NF1 patient, the recurrence risk in another child of the family is different um, it, or is almost not given. Um, but if you have one child with CMMRD, the risk that the next child has CMMRD is one in four. Absolutely. And I, I was wondering, if, because there are so few patients, so few CMMRD patients, that I suppose it's very, there are very few tissues to actually study. But I was wondering if uh, we knew, for example, that uh, a CDM, CMMRD patient who ends up because of this CMMRD ends up being a um, <clears throat> a mosaic NF1 patient because uh, I wondered if you know the biology of the plexiform of, of that patient was was different from the biology of the classic NF1 patients if you had even further mutations in, in that plexiform that could actually lead to it being more difficult to be treated or more prone to or more prone to uh, um, to becoming malignant somehow. Yeah, um, this is unknown currently. Um, mm. We discussed that, of course, that's the big question. Um, will they have a higher risk um, to um, malignatize? Um, but we don't know yet. Um, so far, no MPNSC has been seen in, in CMMRT patients, at least to my knowledge. Yes. Uh, but of course, I, I assume 
suspect that the French group um, who is following this patient um, will carefully um, monitor this. Thank you. We, we now have questions popping up. <laughs> so there is a question from June Ortenberg. Uh, we thank you for this fascinating presentation. And um, you mentioned the fact that you've discussed recommendations for classic NF1 slash legis patients. But what would you recommend for segmental patients? But I think this was discussed. Um, so um, if you have, so if you have a patient with a, I'm not sure if I understand the question. So, um, so I, I think I think it refers to I could ask June to reformulate the question if I haven't understood it correctly, but I think. Um, it makes reference to the fact that you, you may have a a, um, <clears throat> uh, a a segmental patient is what I would call a mosaic patient. Yes. So if 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 you have uh, so what would be your recommendations for somebody Wait. who appears to be a mosaic NF one? Yeah. Uh, in terms of further testing for CMMRD. Yes, um, several patients with CMMRD have been described as having segmental NF1. Yes, that is true. But I would still follow the the um, C for CMMRD recommendations and not because the it is much more likely that the patient is actually a mosaic NF1 patient, um, just by chance and not. Mm to an underlying mismatch repair defect. So that is much more likely than the patient has CMMRD. So even if there is a segmental distribution of the Tafeole spots and no um, mutation is found, I would still follow um, the recommendations and um, analyze CMMRD only if um, another feature or pointing in direction CMMRD is present. Thank you. Uh, there's another question from Ignacio Blanco. Uh, again, congratulations. And um, he asks, at what age do you consider a patient as a child to suspect a CMMRD? There's always this big debate, you know, when, when does a child stop being a child in terms of... Uh, yeah. Um, most Patients with CMMRD who reach um, late teenage age will have a tumor. So I would say um, late teenage age, 17, 18, and the patient does not have a malignancy, I, I would stop considering CMMRD as a differential diagnosis. But of, of course, this is just my thoughts about it. I have no proof or, or any study to support this. We know yes. some, some patients with CMMRD who have attenuated CMMRD, but often they have also less papillary spots. So the clear, I would suspect, also no evidence um, supporting this, but my suspicion would be those patients who have attenuated CMMRD have not so much of an NF1 phenotype. Thank you. Ignacio points out that they used to consider that after the age of eight, people should have at least two or, or two or more signs of NF for, for an, an, an NF diagnosis. Yeah. Um, another question from uh, Jose Velasquez. Uh, who says, um, what would you say are the key points to suspect a case of CMMRD in an initial suspected cases of NF1 with a negative result in molecular testing? So which are, the, you know, the most important features one should look at within all, all the ones that you have listed? Well, I think um, consanguinity is uh, an important point. At least in our population, we see that often that um, parents 
uh, consanguineous, and I'm always um, worried um, when I see consanguinity. Um, of course, a diagnosis of Lynch syndrome in 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 a parent is um, a very strong sign. Um, a diagnosis of another sibling, um, say um, about the same age, also having NF1 signs is also very suspicious because either you find the mutation, so either the parents are a um, mosaic and the children have inherited the same mutation from the parents, but if you don't find in both children the variant, then there is a big suspicion of CMMRD. Yeah. Um, mm. Multiple pilomatic comas, usually you won't have a um, brain MRI, but people who have seen a lot of brain MRIs on CMMRD patients say these DVAs, which are frequently not reported by the by the radiologists because DVAs are mm, benign um, brain MRI findings and usually the radiologists would not report them because they are irrelevant um, for for the for the clinic of the patient. Um, but if you have I wouldn't do a brain MRI in such a child just to find the DVA, but if you have a brain MRI, I would always ask the radiologist if there are DVAs and if there are if there is one DVA that is frequent. But if yes. there are multiple in different areas of the brain, that is highly suspicious. So, so you recommend to, to actually make sure that the, the radiologist is clearly asked to, to look for a DVA in case of a... You, if you start thinking in such a child of mm. MRD as a possible differential diagnosis, I would not do an MRI to find a DVA. But mm -hmm. if is for another reason an MRI. I would ask specifically the radiologist, can you look for DVAs? Thank you. Uh, we, we have another question from Jundira Chen, who asked if if if, if the, the cafe au lait spots in CMMRD patients, do they always have an NF1 mutation? So <laughs> I, I can... I can tell only from um, um, one patient that we were um, allowed to take some tissue and it was um, cultivated at UAB. Um, the melanocytes were cultivated um, and no NF1 mutation, no spread one mutation was found. Um, okay. But um, that doesn't rule out that there was an NF1 mutation, but um, this has not been tested very frequently, to my knowledge. I, I know only of my own analysis together with Ludwig Maxian, um, and um, there we could not find an uh, We have another question from Andrea or Andrea Peterson, who asked that generally, as a, as a geneticist, um, a pilomitricoma makes me think of myotonic dy dystrophy which can also be preclinical. Uh, should we use age as a differentiating factor for this? So, but in myotonic dystrophy, you won't have cafe lay spots, I assume. Um, so, um, 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 the, the multiple pilomatricomas are, um, are um, indicative of myotonic dystrophy, but this will, will be a, a different cohort of patients um, where you suspect that. So um, we are talking about patients who have NF1 features as well. Or yes, exactly. Who has a malignancy. But if you were, I think the question was, if you were to use the pilomatricoma as as you know, as one one criterion, uh, sh should you also use age as a discriminating factor at all? Maybe that was more the sense of the of the question. 
you 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 were very clear that it's not you 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 can't differentiate just just based on one factor. That's very clear. Yeah. But I think I think this uh, this certainly has a <clears throat> once you have a, a feeling whether you know if you were to look only at the pyelomyotrichoma, then would you use age as a differentiating factor? No. I, the, answer <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> um, okay, there's you know, another question. Are just something you see in children, you don't see that in others usually. Yes. During life. Yeah, because Andrea says she, he or she has a lot of patients that have an unexplained cafe au lait. Yeah. And um, another question has come up uh, from Eniko Pivnik. Uh, he says, uh, in any documented case, uh, who has a non-mosaic NF1 and independent from CMMRD, I would imagine that patient presents with usual and unusual features and malignancies. Uh, would it be recommended to test for CMMRD even if the NF1 test is positive from blood lymphocytes? So would you recommend to test, you know, not to be, because I think that the sense of the question is the two could coexist. It could be both CMMRD and NF1. Could be, yeah. Nothing is impossible in our world. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to analyze such a patient. If this is a, a malignancy that is not very typical for NF1 and very typical for CMMRD, mm. I would test, yeah. If this would be a T-cell lymphoblastic leukemia, a lymphoma, I would test, yes. If this would yes. be a great glioma, I would, I would recommend to do that, especially because um, when you do testing for NF1, um, if there is a high number of cells having um, the mutation, um, um, you may not distinct, be able to distinguish between a mosaic or a um, timeline uh, or a constitutional mutation. That might be difficult at some time. Well, before we close, I actually have a question regarding this, myself regarding this glioma. Did I understand correctly that you suspect that many patients who were labeled as NF1 in the past and who actually had a malignant glioma were de facto not NF1, they were C CMMRDs, and that yeah. I understood that correctly, that de facto in the NF1, in the bona fide NF1 population, uh, there is not such a high risk of a malignant glioma. That that would be um yeah what you could use from that. I think we need studies to do that, but I think that the old literature on um NF1 patients where this diagnosis was not genetically confirmed. Um, could contain a number of um, CMMRD patients. So, for instance, also um, for the secondary, um, um, where do I have my slides? So, for instance, um, for instance, in this paper um, from Marius. Um, where they reported secondary MDS, AML. Some patients had um, um, typical CMMRD tumors as the first tumor. So I suspect a number of these patients had CMMRD and um, also a number of the published pediatric high-grade gliomas. I, just one thing. The first CMMRD patient I got it from an a person very experienced in NF1, um, and she said, um, "I want." That was long time ago in two thousand 
and three, I think. And she said, I want, I usually don't want to know what is the N of one mutation because at that time it was very difficult to find it. It, it took a long time. But I want to know in this case because this patient has a high grade glioma, it has a glioblastoma. Mm -hmm. Then and then we didn't find a mutation. Yeah. But the, an experienced person in NF1 thought this was an NF1 patient. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, but th th this message is very, very important, I think. It's very, very important. Um, <clears throat> our time is up, and I can't see any other questions in the chat. Uh, thank you very, very much, Katerina, for being with us today and for making very, very clear to all of us uh, what the overlaps and the issues with these um, misdiagnoses are. Uh, I want to thank the audience as well for being very participative today. And uh, this um, this masterclass will be uploaded on the YouTube channel as soon as humanely feasible. And, um, and I look forward to seeing everyone at the next classes. Um, thank you again, everyone, and especially Katarina for being with us today. Thank you for having Goodbye. me. Bye. Bye.